My sister sent me this story, um, and it was back in Yom Kippur time, but it, it, it's where the whole how close is close idea came from. So imagine you're on a subway, and suddenly you realize that your soulmate, the one you've been waiting for and praying for your entire life, is standing beside you. And you're full of love and disbelief, and you can't speak. And then your soulmate is leaving, walking off the train, and, and you freeze, and you manage, what's your number? And you only hear the first three digits, and then the door closes. At the next stop, you run to a payphone, because you don't have a cell phone. And frantically, you try every combination of numbers imaginable. You fail. You start driving through the streets. You're crying. You're searching. You're overwrought. You're driving dangerously. You're running red lights. Finally, you're arrested for reckless behavior. Imprisoned, brokenhearted, and alone, you await your trial. <laughs> you prepare yourself terrified of the possible judgment. And as you enter the courtroom, you are surprised and relieved and confused to see that the judge you have feared is actually your soulmate. <laughs> the very person you've been seeking and whose absence created the sadness that made you lose your way. You break down, and your soulmate says the words that change your life. I know you've made mistakes, but let's not think about that now. Today, I just want to be close to you. You are seeking forgiveness for mistakes. Well, I know how hard this world can be. And I know you long for meaning, and sometimes mistakes happen. And now, I just want to be close to you. So here's a thought. What if this thing that we call God, what if that's all it wants? Just to be close to us. For us to invite this living essence, presence of peace, this representation of unconditional compassion into our lives. It's just waiting. What a concept. I mean, there's all this talk of people needing to find God or seeking God. And what, it's a, what if it's as simple as this, that God or spirit or one or all or oneness, whatever we want to call it, in this moment I'll call it life. What if life is seeking us, waiting for us to invite it in, to say, yes, I want to experience this, and to open up and get close to or with it. What a great thought. Uh, e. Stanley Jones was a Methodist theologian who he spent a great deal of time in India teaching, and he, um, he used to sit with Gandhi, and they used to banter about faith, which, I don't know, can you imagine bantering about faith with Gandhi? But he made this statement that I thought was awesome. Prayer is surrender, Surrender to the will of God and cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. Now before we get too crazy, what is this will of God thing? So many people use this phrase, the will of God, uh, in their moments of giving up in a situation that's horrible. You know, they say, well, it was the will of God, which uh, I'm just going to challenge. I'm just going to challenge it. Because most of the time, when I've heard that phrase, it's actually been because of something that was caused by humans. It was the will of humans. Um, or the weather. Which, you know, if we really want to go there, the weather's changing because of the will of humans. So it's all us. And, and many great spiritual teachers teach that the will of God, quote unquote, is actually good, peace, wholeness. The will of God is that feeling when we are compelled to do something kind for another person or animal. The will of God is to live together in peace understanding, and compassion. Now, some people are going to yank out their Hebrew Bible, also known as the Old Testament, and show examples of the will of God that looks like punishment and vengeance. Well, here's my response that I will share with you that you can feel free to use. God didn't write that. 
didn't write any of it. Man wrote it. A bunch of men from an age of war and fear and oppression wrote it. So that argument is no longer useful or helpful. Out. All right, so let me, uh, while I'm changing all the rules, let, let me clarify something. So I'm going to just keep changing everything. So if the word God has charge for you, because I'm going to use it a lot today. So if it has charge or it triggers something negative or it makes you kind of, uh, let me explain what I mean when I use the word God. Because to me, God, the word, represents an essence, a great love, the thing that connects all of this. It's not a man in the sky. It's not Charlton Heston on a mountain. And it's not a very handsome actor being flogged and beaten. It is not a person. It is us, our breath. It's that feeling that we can't explain when we know we're one with everything. That. And when that presence is sensed within us, that's what I mean by close, by getting close. So, so how close is close? How close do I let this creative power and energy get to me? How consistently can I get and stay close with it? How and when do I drift? What happens when I resist? What is the truth that I know about me? Who do I become? How do I treat others? When I forget that I'm a grand container for this incredible formless life, what happens to me? Well, I totally know what happens to me. <laughs> and it's not pretty. Let me just tell you that right now. It looks like road rage. It looks like cortisol-driven reactive Facebook comments that I have to go back and delete. It looks like excuses. It looks like petty rationalizations and holding grudges. It looks like judgment of others and myself. And it's a way low vibration. Just low. So flip it now. Let's, let's flip it. What does it look like when I am feeling that closeness, when I'm remembering who I am and why I'm here? What well, looks like allowing? It looks like yielding. It looks like understanding and patience. It looks like gratitude and laughter. It looks like empathy and support. It looks like healing. It looks like cooperation with this larger operating system of the universe. And that vibration poof, through the roof. So allowing ourselves to be that close with whatever we call it gives us the freedom to express it, to live as it, and be examples of it, to be it. There's a lot going on in our world right now, and specifically in our country at this very moment. And right now is an amazing opportunity for us to figure out how close is close in so many different ways. One of my friends uh, commented recently on Facebook that she was feeling isolated and alone because her friends hadn't reached out to ask her how she was doing. She's African American and she now lives in the US and she mentioned specifically how she felt abandoned by her Caucasian friends because they had not offered words of support. And I was not alone when I responded to her with my words of comfort and hesitation because we didn't know what to say. And so what I wrote to her was, I want to support and never hurt, to encourage and not condescend, to hold the presence without seeming uninterested. It's too big for words, and yet we need to speak. And my feelings were totally validated by a long thread of other friends who were like that. We didn't know what to say. We, we didn't want to insult you. We didn't want to sound like we thought we understood. And that was getting close. That was that how close is close. Suddenly, we were having this dialogue about what, what do we say right now? So it's about bridging this space, that appearance of separation, 
that events and moments in this world create. It's, it's about that. And so here's another moment of close is close that's happening recently. And yes, he's back, Pope Francis. I think he's just going to be in all of my talks now because he's just so awesome. Um, the other gentleman up there in white is named Arnold Abbott. He is a man of 90 years. He has been repeatedly arrested in Florida for feeding the homeless. He's been setting up these little tables with other pastors and people, sacred servers, and he's been feeding the homeless, and every day he gets arrested for doing that. And he won't stop. If I remember correctly, I read something recently where they're like, we're done, we're not arresting him anymore. Because it's ridiculous. He's doing it on his own. He's got, he's, yeah. So he won't, he won't be stopped. Meanwhile, Florida, meanwhile in Rome, <laughs> Pope Francis heard that one of his archbishops, Archbishop Krajewski, had met a homeless man named Franco and found out that it was Franco's birthday and wanted to throw Franco a birthday party. Except that Franco didn't want to attend because he was ashamed of how he smelled and how he looked. So when word got back, back to Pope Francis, he immediately ordered the construction of showers in St. Peter's Square, fully stocked with soap and towels, whatever they needed, so that no one would feel unwelcomed in the Vatican. What's, what's, what's close? <laughs> I mean, the vibration that Arnold Abbott and Pope Francis, they're raising it up. They are raising it up, and they don't care what anybody thinks. God, I pray for his safety every day, because <laughs> he's rocking the boat. And he's also, just for those of you who don't know, since February, he's been caught sneaking out at night um, without his security detail to feed the homeless. And they're furious with him, because it's like a, a horrible security risk. But he dresses down and he sneaks out and doesn't let anybody know and he goes and takes care of his, of his people and then comes home. High vibration, really close. He's got it. So that's, when somebody asks me what does God look like, that. That's what God looks like. It looks like being kind about thinking what can I do? So last Saturday, I, I went with two um, students of One Spirit who are living in Anchorage. Um, they are asked to go visit different places of worship, and they kindly asked me to join them at Temple last week. And so we went to the Saturday morning service at Beth Shalom. Growing up Jewish, I remember what Saturday morning services were like at my temple. And I was very pleased and surprised that this was very different. Um, because it was such a small group of people, we didn't sit formally in the chairs with the rabbi up on the bima. We actually had a small circle of chairs. There were about a dozen of us. And we sat and we did the by rote prayers. You know, you go through the prayer book and, you, and the rabbi was really funny. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to say like, hey, we're visitors, slow down. But it's like he knew what he was doing and he's like, okay, page 30. Okay, page 32. All right, now page 35. Okay, read that in silence. All right, here. You know, and just boom, 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 boom. So knowing most of the prayers, I was cool with it, but I felt bad for my friends who were like, what the heck is going on? You know, speed of light. But um, instead of giving a talk, he actually just facilitated a dialogue. And he said something that was really awesome and surprising. He was commenting about uh, what was happening in Ferguson because we hadn't gotten the verdict yet from Staten Island. He was talking about the riots and the... the the response and what was happening. And he said that when people say, I'm giving it to God, or I'm just going to pray and let God work it out, that we are taking the most cowardly way out possible. And in turn, we're putting, on, we're putting something on God, which is ridiculous. Because he actually said, because God doesn't care. And you could feel it in the circle, like, Go, what? <laughs> Growing up as a Reformed Jew, I'm like, yeah, all right, I get where you're coming from. But the other folks were like, what do you, wait, what do you mean? You know, God doesn't care. And he was saying exactly this. God is not a person. 
God is not a personality. God doesn't favor one team or country or religion over another. God didn't write the Bible. You know, God doesn't decide what's right or wrong. And in case you're noticing the comparison, God also doesn't keep a list of who's naughty or nice, just for the record. So for some reason in our history of religious uh, exploration, we have felt the need to create a big daddy who's going to monitor us and, of course, monitor our neighbors, which we're going to help with, you know. And, and this big dad is going to decide who's good and rewarded and who's bad and who's punished. And this simply isn't how it works. This is anything but a sense of closeness. God works through us, as us. We are it. We are the creator's creation. And it's living and moving and talking and driving and Facebooking through us. All of us, as us. And I know, not all spiritual paths on the surface agree with this, although if you look at the core of most of them, they actually do. Um, and it just does, it sounds maybe a little like I'm spouting my own dogma up here, and maybe I am. So there. However, let's, let's check it. Let's check it. Which works best for you? Which has a higher vibration? Which makes you feel closer? All right? So we got, on the one hand, believing in a male figure in the sky who chooses to bless and punish who we must bow our heads to in order to gain favor, who holds us as powerless victims to his whims, who actually believes that one team or one country or one religion is more important or worthy than another, that some of us were created more or less worthy than the other. Or a neutral, creative energy that has been and continues to co-create through its creation that expresses itself in each moment through how we express it. The one love, the allness. We experience what we put out in words and actions, compassion, forgiveness, listening, seeing each other. An essence that we co-create with to experience the life we want no matter what the appearance is that's thrown at us. And in fact, to be so close with this thing called God that we can actually see and break through any appearance that is happening in order to get to the larger truth. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm going with door number two. <laughs> I'm like, I'm taking it. I understand why people would want the first one. And, and I can't do it. I can't do it. So I'd like to share a moment, a personal moment, that I had recently that is a small example of this second piece and of how feeling as close as possible even when it seems impossible. So currently I uh, have been dealing, and I should say I have not been dealing, my body has been dealing with some strange and random autoimmune stuff. And it shows up in different areas of my body, in different ways, and honestly, it wreaks havoc with me physically and emotionally, and a lot more often than I wanted to. So one night a few weeks ago, it felt like my whole body was staging a mutiny. Like, I just felt like my whole body was like, that's it, we've had it, you know? And I'm like, wait, wait, everybody, chill, you know? And um, it was just like a full-on, we're done with you kind of, kind of thing. And I felt really broken and tired of all of it. And I was laying on my bed, and I was crying. And out loud, I said, okay, gratitude list time. And I started shouting all of the things that I was grateful for. Tears flowing down my face, shouting truth after truth. I'm grateful for the home that I love. I'm grateful for my safety, for Maddie, for friends and family, and food in my fridge, for Spirit Stone, for my car, for finally, 
finding socks that keep my feet warm, all of it, just one thing after the next after the next. And then I was crying even more because in that moment, I got how close is close. I felt so close with spirit. Things can completely suck and we can still be grateful. Everything can be falling apart around us and we can still feel a connection to each other and something larger than us. There's an inner guidance or a love, whatever. Things can seem to be as far from what we want them to be and yet we can still feel close to that thing. And so we embody this powerful energy and then we co-create the changes for ourselves and the world around us. Ellen Grace O'Brien is from the Center of Spiritual Enlightenment in San Jose, and she says this, The goal of prayer is not to change any circumstance, but to raise our understanding to a spiritual perspective. Effective prayer changes our consciousness. With transformed consciousness, we live in a new way. That is what changes things. It's on us. If we give it to God or see praying for others as this passive experience, then we're putting all the ownership and responsibility on an entity that isn't out there. And so then, when, like the rabbi said, so when the money doesn't show up, or the divorce happens, or the tornado hits, we say, well, where was God? We blame God for not showing up. I loved that he was brave enough to speak about that. So when we pray, or whatever we call communing with that thing, we're not trying to convince God to do something for us or to make something happen. We're shifting our consciousness to be present with what is. And then we, acting as spirit, God, whatever, become the change we want to see. Just like earlier with the boat, we're not pulling God to us. We're pulling ourselves closer to spirit, to peace, to community with others, to wholeness. God is always there because it is within us. It is us. Nothing can get closer than that. Let's pray. Oh. I just keep wanting to say, yes, God. I want to like jump into a Baptist church right now and say, hallelujah, yes, God. Because I'm feeling that. This opportunity right now, this is an opportunity right now to get totally sucked into the appearance of what's not working and who's to blame. Now is the time to collect our inner resources, to start speaking, living, breathing, moving, moving, thinking from a place of what we want to see. To see the miracle and change that's happening through the chaos. To find spirit, God, love, compassion, allness, oneness, to find it in the noise. Because it's there. It's in the moments of helping each other. It's in the moments of reaching out to each other. It's in the moments of saying, I don't feel heard or seen, and having people say, I see you. I hear you. Tell me what you want me to say. Teach me how to love you how to see you and then doing it. It's about letting our inner critic take
take a vacation. Because that's not the voice of God. The voice of God is that voice of creation that created each one of us that says, oh my goodness, I'm so proud of you. You did it again today. You got out of bed. You got dressed. You did it. I'm so proud of you. You walked away from that argument with peace in your heart. I'm so proud of you. Now let's go make some peace in the world. If you're hearing or I'm hearing, if any of us are hearing anything other than that in our inner critic, then I encourage each one of us to say thank you for your input. And now I'm done listening to you. I'm ready to hear something else from my inner guidance. I'm ready to hear love. I'm ready to hear compassion, forgiveness. I'm ready to be lifted to a higher vibration. I'm ready to let go of the low. So I say thank you for the chaos because it is lifting us above it already. We're already there. We're already seeing possibility, already seeing change. We are all waking up. And we're waking up to discover just how close we are to that love that's there. So I, I just keep in mind anyone who is struggling, anyone who is challenged, anyone who is having a moment going, I can't do this yet. I just hold you in that space of yes. There's no timetable. The good's always there when we're ready to tap in. And the light is always shining so that we can find our way. Thank you. Thank you to the universe for providing us with this amazing life. So grateful. Amen. Ashe.